Hey guys, welcome back to Midwest Whitetail. We're sitting here in early July and myself and Chad Holmes are actually about to load the truck up and head north to Minnesota. We're gonna be visiting our great partners, Arctic Shield, as they are releasing a brand new hunting line for this coming fall. So we're very excited to go get a first hand look at that. And once we do, we'll bring it to you guys as soon as we can. But on this week's episode, we're very excited. Where it's all about tree stand locations and First up, we're gonna join Caleb Griner. As you saw on last week's show, he's been very busy with Lee Abraham down there in Southern Iowa, trying to get the farm ready for that GQ Junior buck. And now he's finally been able to get back home and do some of his own pieces. He's got most of his trail cameras deployed, but the big topic of discussion today is going to be surrounding that guard's deer. For all of you that had followed the Hog Junior story in 2022, there's the deer that he calls guards, encountered him multiple times. It was his first year on the farm. And the whole story for this year is hopefully getting Steve, the landowner that gives Caleb permission to hunt, a chance at that deer. So very excited to watch that. Caleb's gonna dive into what he learned year one, how it influences stand locations for year two, what data variables, weather, et cetera, that he pays attention to when selecting a stand. And then following that, we're gonna jump over to Area 52 with Zach Rosmus. Zach has been busy at the Goat Hills on his new permission farm, but on this one, he's going and introducing two new stand locations, why those stand locations are good, and what bucks he thinks he's gonna be able to catch up with if he's hunting them. So before we dive into those stories on this episode, I'm gonna dive into a couple of scenarios that I found myself in when trying to decide on picking a tree stand location. And the first one that I would set the stage for is you've never hunted a farm, you have no intel, and it's a blank slate as far as information goes. And that's the exact scenario that I find myself in for this 23 season. If you saw last week's show, I introduced that new river farm, a couple of the satellite pieces. The landowner was very gracious and gave me permission to hunt, but she didn't really have much information as far as what deer were there, where they went. She just told me there's deer on the properties, have at it. And so my approach when in that situation, it's pretty much the same year to year. I'm going to always start at a map. And with Onyx, there's a lot of different features at your disposal. Obviously, you've got topo lines. You've got different layers, such as acorn mass producing trees. You've got crop land information. And so before I ever step onto a property, I'm able to identify quite a few things. Pinches, places I wanna put tree stands, what access is at my disposal. And once I get to the farm, I'm trying to take the information I think that I have. And when I go out there, I'm looking for summer signs, sure, but the most important thing to me is trying to identify late October rut sign. What are the deer going to be doing when I'm hunting them? So I'm looking for historic rub lines. I'm looking for historic scraping trees, you know, broken limbs, etc. Looking for the pinches and changes in cover. And so those times when I'm going out there deploying summer cameras, looking and scouting, it's very, very important to try to be paying attention to sign that's current and past. And that really gives me a good starting point when preparing for opening day. Now, once I get to opening day, I always like to start wide. You know, unless I've got a scenario like that velvet buck back in 2020 where he's on camera, I'm getting him consistently, I've got that opening day cold front, and I'm just throwing all the chips on the table and going after him, I'm always gonna start wide. You hear people talk about observation stands. They are, while you're not in bow range, you're never really out of the game, but you're still just trying to put together piece by piece by piece. And so when I'm in those observation stands, I'm looking for where deer are coming out. I'm letting my cameras that I deployed tell me the information that I need to know before I dive in there. And as the season progresses, you're going to learn a lot about your deer herd, whether they're there, whether they're not, whether your farm holds deer, whether it's a rut farm and deer just cruise through it. And so that just is a learning process through an entire season that if you pay attention to those details, you look at different weather patterns, you look at different wind patterns, bedding areas, etc. It really sets you up for year two. And that's what Caleb's gonna be talking about is how do you take that information from year one and use it to really dial in a piece. He's gonna dive into those hunting scenarios. He's gonna dive into different bedding areas that they identified. And I'm really excited to see if this story comes together for him and Steve. Steve has been very gracious in giving Caleb hunting permission, but I also want to give a big shout out to Caleb, giving his bow to Steve, getting Steve back in the bow hunting. It's a story that I'm most excited to see unfold this year. Let's get right to the action. Let's go. This bottom, these low spots, these deer are like walking through. I 
just want to mark this pinch point. I use that that waypoint a lot. Yeah, that wasn't a bad deer. See all that mass right there? This next camera is up on this bean and corn edge. That does it for the 2023 summer inventory. I've got all my cameras out. Moving forward, you know, we're not gonna slow down. We're gonna keep our foot on the gas pedal and uh, we have to start really thinking about where we're gonna be hanging our stands um, for potential deer that we're gonna be hunting. And last week, if you guys can recall, I mentioned that guards made it. In the next part of our day, we're gonna go over to Steve's farm, join Steve, and we're gonna walk around, look for some potential stand locations, kind of talk about what that deer was doing last year. We'll head over there, join Steve here shortly, and uh, we'll be back with you guys. Come out, pretty good. Man, it's been a fun last couple weeks. Bucks are really putting on inches right now. They're growing fast. I haven't really had anything great for myself to hunt on camera just yet, but you know, they're putting on the inches over at Lee's farm. It's been fun driving around in the evenings. So getting back to the hot topic, getting back to stand placement and how we're gonna kill this one deer that I've been talking about a lot recently, and that's guards. Where I'm at currently is Steve's farm. And for those that don't know, Steve's farms where I got new permission last year and I was hunting hog junior all fall. Ended up capitalizing on the opportunity and um, made a really good connection with the landowner. And it just so happened that one of the bucks that I've been seeing very often last year and uh, had a few other years of history with, guards, just so happens that he's up to bat next on this farm as far as the top hit lister. And I've finally talked Steve into getting back into bow hunting. I gave him my RX-5 from last year, the same bow that I shot Hog Jr. with, and we're gonna try and do the same thing, replicate it with him um, getting after guards. Talking about a stand location for this buck, we do not necessarily have a stand hung for him just yet. Steve isn't as comfortable with hang-on stands, so we're gonna get a ladder stand in here um, in a couple locations. But one of the things that, you know, if I'm going into a farm to hang stands after a certain deer, I'm gonna use my trail cam info from the prior years, and I'm gonna use past encounters that I have, or just that knowledge that I have of the deer movement, the natural deer movement of the farm. And that was something that I really didn't know last year right away. I did run cameras in August, but I kind of had some intel from hunting the neighbor's property on the other side of the fence um, the prior year, and I knew that pinched location would be a good spot to start. But in trying to find other locations on this farm that would be good, I scattered cuttybacks all throughout the farm, and one of the spots that really stood out as far as where this guards buck was showing up is exactly where I'm standing. We are standing in the vine scrape plot. I have a vine scrape right in front of me on my right shoulder. And let me tell you, this guards buck was hitting this sucker hard all October last year. And it was funny, Gavin came, showed up today and we were just talking about this guards buck, talking about last photos that we had of him. And he was looking through the wind and putting these pictures together with it on past winds that we had on those days. You know what, that deer was here on every northwest wind that we had in those pictures. So on a northwest wind, this buck is entering this plot directly over my left shoulder. He's hitting this vine scrape. He's working around the corner and he's going to another camera that we have over on another stand that I already have hung just around this corner. And what this deer is essentially doing, he's coming from the sanctuary part of the farm, which is where he's bedding. In the evening hours, he's coming out here to get a little snack, a little transition green food source. Then he's going out to the destination food source, which is corn, about a half mile to our north. So that's what this buck was doing on a consistent basis last year in the first few weeks of October. So I want to get a stand location somewhere on this farm. So now when I'm picking the stand locations, I got to think northwest wind is probably going to be the best wind. That's when he's popping up here. But he was here on a couple south winds as well. So I probably need a stand location for a northwest wind and I need a stand location for a south wind. Right in front of me to my left is a stand location that I had a couple sits in 
and it was my stand for a northwest wind. It's right where these deer enter the plot. It's within shooting distance of my vine scrape. And with a northwest wind, it sets up perfect to hunt this plot. Now with a southerly wind, I have a stand location to the right where these deer are going to the destination food source. And that stand is solely just in case I do not have a northwest wind, I can still hunt this farm with a south wind if he is still showing up in the plot. So it's always good, that's one thing to look at. You know, it seems whenever I find a really good spot or a spot that my buck's spending a majority of his time, I might even put four stands in there. I want to stand for a south, north, west, east wind, whatever it is, I want to be able to hunt in there without educating the deer. And that's one thing that I really took away. If you guys watched the Story Hog Junior last year, that was one thing that I always took very seriously. If it's a northwest wind and that stand only sets up for say a southwest wind, I'm not gonna go in there even though he's on camera for the last three days. You gotta hunt these deer on the correct wind, don't risk educating them, and cover your bases. But for access on this stand, I always access from the south in the mornings, and the reason being is because I already have determined where they're going in the evening hours. They're going out to the destination food out to my north. So on the south part of the farm, in the morning hours, they should still be out to the north. They're coming back from the north, coming to the south, so I should be fine walking in in those early morning hours to the stand. Now in the evening hours, the deer are bedding in the sanctuary part of the farm and to the north, on the north part of the farm, closer to the pinch. So I'll still access from the south, but if I absolutely had to, you know, last year we had a patch of evergreens that were on Steve's south farm. And there was probably a dozen does that were bedding in it. You know that. October 6th or 7th hunt, I had that whole group come out into the field and they worked around this corner exactly how I'm talking, these deer work through this plot. But I don't have to worry about giving up any part of the south just because that tornado took out all those evergreens this year and there's gonna be no deer bedded to the south because there's just no cover now. So that's one thing to keep in mind, access is key to your stand location. There are a couple factors too that might throw that deer off his pattern that he had from the year before. You know, at the top of the list is probably crop rotation. Most farmers are rotating their crops 50-50 split every year. This field to the north, it has split. The west side is now beans, the east side is now corn. So it could throw the movement off that. They could just go from the sanctuary off to the corn. Hopefully not, but that's why we're putting this transition food source in here. That way they, even though we're taking them maybe 150 yards, off their general path of getting out to the destination food source. It's still not that far, it's close to the bedroom, and it's a perfect spot to help pinch these deer down into a stand location. So, you know, Zach's been really busy over at Area 52 the last couple weeks. I know he's got a couple stands he wants to get hung this week. We'll jump over to him real quick. I'll see you guys on the next one. Let's get some footage of me eating banana. Sweet. <laughs> This is a native flower that was in the mix as well. Rutabaga and then mullein. I don't see many grasses, but forbs are coming up. All right, it's early July and we are back down here at Area 52 and uh, things are looking a lot different down here. It is green and lush and we're standing in a new clover plot for this season and this is a location on my farm that I would call my favorite stand location and it's proven over time to have some really good hunts down here and this inside corner right here was one of the priorities that I had this off season was how can I make it better because one tree stand location things are always changing from year to year you know we've had some logging we've had some changes down here for like the row crop sitting right off to my left where we've done a transition to alfalfa so that green to green transition 
we're always talking about. And I really wanted to make it a priority. How could I make what I would say my best tree stand location this season even better? And what I did is essentially I carved out this little food plot. You know, it's not gonna put off a lot of tonnage, but essentially it's gonna be another location where maybe it's a third of an acre right here located off the row crop, where if I can get the does to come through here during the right time of the season, you know, that's gonna be the idea. And I hopefully we're gonna have a big buck following them or at least a mature buck following them, you know, for sure. So uh, this spot, it actually used to have a big dead white oak that was laying here on the ground. And essentially my process for creating this actual food plot was pretty simple where it comes down to it. I rented some equipment, brought a skid loader in here, removed that big white oak. This is a really cool spot. I relocated it into a different tree and uh, how we're gonna make this spot even better, we've done the food plot, but we're also gonna put a rubbing post at this location right in front of me. Um, you know, I've never really experimented with any types of rope scrapes or, you know, anything like that, but we're gonna set it up and hopefully set this up where fast forward to the end of October, early November, this could be a location where we have an encounter with a good buck. And then we're also gonna go back into the timber today and we're actually gonna hang what I'm gonna consider a rut stand. And there's two specific bucks back at that location that I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna tease it for now. But once we get back into that location, I'll kind of dive into the, those two specific bucks. But it's good to see the alfalfa greening up and it's always good to spend time down here at Area 52. I'd like to leave that camera on that tree that it's on right now. Let me go just a couple steps closer. There's 20 right there. You can tell there used to be trees here. I think I'm gonna bring that rope up a little bit when I do this. We're, we're about half a bubble off, that's all right. Now, I don't know if this makes a difference or not, but I'm just thinking if I can increase the surface area at the bottom of this rope to maybe put a little bit more ascent on it, that might make a difference. One project done, 300 more to go. Well, we finished up the first project of the day, getting that rubbing post up, and we're moving on to the next one. And uh, we have kind of transitioned to a really secluded location on my farm. The first year of ownership um, down here, I actually didn't spend any time out here at all, you know, on this specific location. And it's probably a mistake on my part because I spent a lot of time kind of in this general vicinity last year. And this sets up to be a really cool rut area to actually haunt my farm. Because essentially what it is, it's a big white oak flat, you know, kind of back behind the camera. And then there's this really cool transition where it transitions into creek bottom with this natural fence that essentially has been placed here um, by the farmer for one time was for cattle, but now it's doing a really good job of creating almost a corral type mentality, you know, down here on this bottom. But uh, the tree that I kind of have picked out every single time I'm down here, I stare at this tree and I think, man, that would be a cool stand location is right behind me and it's a bitter nut hickory. It's gonna be one where I, I think I have a high chance of at least having encounters with two separate bucks. One of them being a buck that I called Young Stud. I don't have a name for him yet. I've had a couple encounters, had a few handful of trail cam photos of him, but uh, had a really cool encounter where he actually came through this location where we're standing last year after a rattling sequence. He's a pretty good deer. came screaming up the hill and came into about 40 yards and I wasn't super familiar with him at the time and when he was walking up the hill he was looking pretty good but I think he was a good one to pass because if he made a jump this year he'll be a good one to be chasing and then the second buck is a buck I call Fettuccini 
is a deer that I really only see on one section of my farm. He kind of showed up later on in the year last year. And uh, he, I, I definitely would have called that deer on the hit list last year. He was a good one. This area right in front of me, I'm in the process of transitioning it into a food plot. And it's, it's actually looking really good right now. There's a lot of clover that's coming into it. You know, uh, the big obstacle that you're gonna have with this tree stand location is when to hunt it. It can be difficult to access. I brought up that this is a secluded area of my farm. It's difficult to get to. So you gotta keep in mind that I need to be tactful of how I'm getting in and out of this location where this probably isn't a stand that I'm gonna hunt, um, you know, 10, 12 times a year, but a handful of times a year when it has the right wind, I think can absolutely be a location where I can have a great encounter with one of these bucks. Zero chance. Oh, man. Well, no different than any project. It always seems like down here at uh, Area 52, we got some uh, variables that we're dealing with right now. So this tree, it's the right tree. This is where I want to be. You know, it's going to set up for a south wind where I can hunt this location. There's a couple other trees that are right here, but this is the one. So the muddy quick sticks that I have with me, I love them. I use them all the time. They're just not, the rope's not long enough to make it around the diameter of this tree. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the other side of Area 52. I'm gonna grab uh, ladder sticks that are on this tree stand over there that I don't hunt very often. And we'll put those on this tree and it'll be a perfect setup. You know, and that'll probably be the right decision anyway, because this is more secluded. Um, and that way when we come in here, it'll be ready to hunt. There we go, right into a tree. Well, we are just wrapping up for today. This tree kind of threw us a few curveballs and made it a little bit more difficult than we anticipated just because it's a little bit larger tree. But it, I feel like it's the right tree. Um, we got some good weather coming up here. So here in the coming days where I anticipate we're gonna be getting out and doing some velvet filming. So I'm looking forward to that. We need to get continue to get some cameras out on the goat hills. That's something I keep pushing down the road, but we need to get out there and get that done. And then the next thing I definitely wanna do, do too, especially with this tree behind me, is do some uh, pole saw trimming, get some lanes cut and to make sure that those are ready when the time comes. But we appreciate you guys joining us this week on Midwest Whitetail and please tune in next week to continue on the journey.